Greetings, fellow Gorehounds. Before we begin this review, I want to first remind all of you that SAG-AFTRA and the WGA, the Actors Guild and the Writers Guild, are still currently on strike. So I'm going to include in the description of this video a link to both of their websites so that you can further educate yourself on why exactly these two guilds are striking, as well as a link to the Entertainment Fund if you want to help them more directly. And as you probably already know, movies cannot get made without writers and actors as much as the rich fucks in charge want to convince all of you that they can be replaced with AI, they can't and they shouldn't be replaced with AI. So fuck the corporates, support the unions, and uh, let's get on with this review. Greetings, fellow Gorehounds, and welcome back to a Blood Splattered Vlog. I'm the Horror Guru. And I'm Count Jacula. And today we're going to talk about Perpetrator, the latest Shudder original from director Jennifer Reeder, who some of you may know as the director of Knives and Skin and Night's End. One of which I'm pretty sure we did talk about on this channel. I'm pretty sure we did talk about Night's End. It's the one where it's like a shut-in who is like trying to perform oh, an exorcism. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then it goes like And it crazy. goes awry. Goes crazy from there. She also did the wraparound segment for VHS 94 with the SWAT team and stuff. This movie actually has more in common with Knives and Skin, though. Both movies involve a high school in which a girl has gone missing. Yep. Though this one differs from that one because that one was way more about a town's reaction to a missing girl. It's very Twin Peaksy. This one, it's more like there is a missing girl at the center of a plot that the main character discovers. Yeah, the main character is the person trying to solve this mystery. She is another girl in the school trying to figure out who the hell is kidnapping these other teenage girls. But there's also a second mystery in this movie beyond just who is kidnapping these girls. Yeah. There is the mystery of what the hell is going on with the main character's body. She seems to be having some sort of either supernatural evolution happening to her body or she's going crazy. So you're not yeah, sure yeah. which. She's either going insane or she's turning into a critter. Yeah. And, and you're also not sure as a viewer how much of it is literally happening and how much of it is like dream logic. Yeah, because there's a fair amount of both. Now, to be clear, all of that gets answered by the end of the movie. You find out whether it's real or dream logic by the end of it, you find out what's happening to her and you find out what's happening to these girls. Unfortunately, those are all spoilers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are all spoilers. Keep in mind though, mm -hmm. if you wanna know a little bit of what the movie's about without mm -hmm. getting into the plot, it is all about patriarchy. Yes, the entire movie is about patriarchy, the effects of patriarchy on young teenage girls. That feeds into like the missing girls, right? You yeah. know, you have obviously someone going off and kidnapping the missing girls. So yeah. there's like misogyny there, but there's also the way the school and the world around her is reacting to these missing girls. Yeah, it's the way that patriarchy conditions mm -hmm. young girls to behave. And on top of that, whatever the hell is going on with the main character, whether it's in her head, whether it's a physical transformation, it's kind of like Ginger Snaps in that it is a metaphor in and of itself. Yeah. In Ginger Snaps case, that was a metaphor for going through puberty as a woman, very teen wolf. Yeah. <laughs> But in this case, it's a metaphor for being a woman in a patriarchal society, essentially. Yeah, specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're not into a uh, very surreal David Lynchy meets David Cronenbergian art house films about patriarchy and feminism, then, then go, go watch, watch something, something else. Because that's all this movie is. Yeah, yeah. This movie is that toe to tip. <laughs> now, personally, I dig myself an art house film. And oh, I, fuck yeah. I dig myself a feminist screed film. And I thought this film was actually pretty well done. I wasn't sure how to think about it through like most of the yeah. running time. But once everything comes together at the end, I'm like, oh my God, masterpiece. Yeah. I was like, this works. Yeah. The thing that separates this movie from things like Hereditary or mm -hmm. the Ari Aster films is it has a traditional mystery structure, right? Yeah. You have the person looking for clues, interviewing people, trying to figure out what's going on. And then eventually by the end of it, they figure out whatever conspiracy is going on. Yeah. Involving the mystery, right? Yeah. The, uh, Nancy Drew. Yeah, it's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like Nancy Drew. If Nancy Drew might be turning into a monster. Yeah, most of the cast is like 
character actors, mm -hmm. you know, fairly not particularly. There's well a lot known. of unknowns in this movie. Yeah, a lot of unknowns in this movie, with one exception, and that is Alicia Silverstone. <laughs> Her weird, creepy aunt, whose allegiance is unclear, and you're not entirely sure if she's on the main character's side or not. For most of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> because she's so off putting and creepy, you're just like, okay, does she have your best interest in heart, or is there another agenda here? Like, it's. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that the movie touches on is being a mixed race kid. That's the other factor in this movie because the main character is mixed race. Her father is white, mm -hmm. so we assume her mother is black. Yes, her mother who you is know. absent, which is another mystery of what the hell's going on with her mother and why is her mother absent, which is again, another spoiler that we'll get into in the spoiler section. Yeah. Because that shit goes deep into some patriarchal oh, fucking theming. I really enjoyed this movie and I really liked it, even though for most of the running time, I was sitting they're going, what the fuck is even going on? Yeah, yeah, like you understand everything that's happening on screen that you're yeah. seeing, but you find yourself going, why are they doing this? Yeah, it threads this very interesting needle. It doesn't explain itself until it absolutely needs to explain itself, but it also doesn't over explain itself. Yeah. There's still, even when you get answers towards the end, this element of like dream logic, kind of like a David Cronenberg's Videodrome. The metaphor is not as thick as in no, Videodrome. No, no. It's not it's, as impenetrable. It's not as impenetrable. No, no, You know, no. like Videodrome, like you have to sit with for a long time to get everything that's going on. It's a good example though of a movie in which you have a straightforward mystery going on with just surrealism invading the movie constantly. Yeah. And you're not sure what's real and what's not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and body horror. Yeah, That's body the other horror. thing. There's, there's some body horror in this movie. Yeah, it reminds me of bit of Donnie Dargo where I can see it. Yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Where you have this elevated environment that the character inhabits mm -hmm. and something strange is happening to them that yep. makes them an outsider. I'll give you one taste of the kind of weird surrealism that doesn't really give anything away. The main character, whenever she bleeds her period blood, bleeds period. Or yeah, you're right. Bleeds period. Bleeds period. Her yeah. blood creates, creates a portal, portal to another, another dimension. dimension. Yeah. And you're not sure if this is just like a metaphor or if it's literal or if it's in her head until you get towards the end of the movie and you start and getting then, answers. And then it explains what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I can't even really tell you what genre this thoroughly sits in without kind of giving the it away. The only thing I can give you is that it is a murder mystery. Yeah. There is a murder yeah, mystery at is, the center of it. There's a murder, there's a mystery, and someone has stumbled onto it. Yep, absolutely. And it is 100% art house. Yeah. This movie is going to be an acquired taste. I have the taste, yeah. so I ate good. I ate good while watching this movie. But if you don't have the taste, it's going to be a little sour in your mouth. Some other reasons you should see this movie is that the main character is also bisexual. Like, she makes it very clear that she's eaten out a bunch of women. And then there's also, like, that guy well, like, she kisses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, her attraction to men and women is a, is a major part of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. You know? If you want to support an LGBT horror film starring a woman of color that is a feminist statement and is artsy as all fuck, then you should definitely check out Perpetrator. Especially if if you liked Knives and Skin, because that's the closest film to this in terms of Jennifer Reeder's filmography. If you like that movie, you're gonna fucking dig this one. Perpetrator is currently available on Shudder. It is a Shudder original movie. It'll probably end up on home video at some point so you can buy the Blu-ray, but I do not know when it's gonna hit any other platform. So if you have Shudder, go check it out and enjoy. And with that said, let us move on to the spoilers. All right, let's ease you in. This is a dark fantasy movie. Yes. Everything that you are watching is literally happening. Yeah, it's not just surreal dream logic. It may feel like it. Yeah, it does feel like it. But it's actually a literal thing that's happening. It's it's kind of like um, they clone Tyrone. Yeah, they, yeah. Where yeah, the movie exact, has this yeah. surreal angle to it, but once you get answers, it's actually all literal. Yeah. Even though it feels surreal. Yeah, yeah, they clone Tyrone, which is basically, you're like, what the fuck is going on? And then you realize science fiction movie. It's actually a good comparison to this movie because much like this movie's about patriarchy, they clone Tyrone's all about racism. And yeah, yeah. It's all about white supremacy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it is a good companion movie in that way. <laughs> yeah. Perpetrator is not quite as bombastic. No, it's a smaller indie art house film in comparison. Yes. Whereas They Clone Tyrone is a more bigger budget science fiction action movie. Someone like put They Live and I'm going to get you sucked up yeah. into the same movie. You know? Yeah, absolutely. This is like a weird fucking mix of like, there's a little bit of blue velvet in this. You've got a little bit of ginger snaps in here with the kind of metaphors going on. And Nancy Drew is 
is yeah. the other thing I kept yeah. thinking of. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a Nancy Drew connection, which they clone Tyrone also had. Al also had, it's yeah. true. It's true. So here's the thing. What is literally happening to the main character to answer that mystery first? She is actually a weird mutant that has developed extreme empathy. And she's part of a family of women that have yeah. developed this mutant power of extreme empathy. And it allows them to do each individually different kinds of things. Yeah. But the one thing they can all do is deeply empathize on like a really deep, surreal yeah, level yeah. They, they, with everyone else. Yeah. To give an example of the kind of superpowers this gives, you have her power that like where she can bleed and create this weird alternate dimension of like, like a blood womb. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of like the period sunken place. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a period sunken place, but you can throw other people in it. You can, which she actually does at yeah, one point Yeah, that in the happens movie. at one point a, in the movie. As, as a way of getting away from one of the bad guys. Her mom, it turns out, is actually her dad. Yeah. Basically, it turns out her mom has the power to empathize on a level to where she can turn into the person she's empathizing with. She's, yeah, she's, she's like, shapeshift. She's like morph. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So she has the morph power and she has been living a huge chunk of her life as the dad because living as a white man is easier than living as a black woman. Yeah. As a teenage daughter, she's given her like Poor dad, no end yeah. of shit. But throughout the whole thing, you're like, well, this dad's really trying. But you also understand why the kid is angry. There's like a barrier between her when she's the dad and the daughter than when she's the mom. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Because as the mom and actually having her dark skin can actually relate to the things that she's going through. Whereas as long as she's in the dad's skin, you're a white man, you have no idea what the fuck I have to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Like you cannot even begin to lecture me on shit. Like, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It talks about the assumption from both angles. Absolutely. You know? And so, like, that's an example of the kind of, like, superhuman X-Men-esque powers they get through their empathy. Yeah. It's like they're fucking witches. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the witch metaphor is there, right? Yeah. Like, when she goes to visit her aunt, her aunt feels like this old witch that's, like, going to pass down some knowledge, right? Yeah. For a huge chunk of this movie, I was like, okay, they're vampires, right? That's what's going yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. They're, like, vampires because there's all this emphasis on blood and stuff. But then there was this other element. I don't know how to describe it other than there, there was, was a, a mirroring, mirroring thing, thing happening in the movie. movie. Yes. Like a character would get hurt and then the main character would feel it. A great example is when she's talking to her aunt and her aunt chomps down and then she bites her tongue. Yeah. Not the aunt, but she bites her own tongue. Yep. It's a reflection of her empathy. She can 100% feel and experience the things that are happening around her to an overwhelming extent, which again is kind of a metaphor for being a young teenage woman. Yeah. <laughs> having that overwhelming amount of emotions and hormones coming at you at once. And, yes. and And having to like fucking sift through it like you're fucking Xavier in the fucking machine. Now on to the mystery of the missing teenage girls. So it turns out that what's happening here is the principal and is he a cop or a sheriff? It seems like it was a... He seems to be the sheriff. Yeah, okay. So the sheriff and the principal are teaming up together to kidnap young women. Young women. Teenage girls in order to give a facelift to like their wives. It actually answers a whole lot of weirdness that happened earlier in the movie. There's a scene in which the uh, main character, whose name is Johnny, I believe. Her name yeah. is Johnny Baptiste. She is being interrogated by the school counselor who's yeah. like asking her all these questions that don't seem like questions a school counselor would actually ask. Or if she would ask them, she wouldn't necessarily be writing them down as part of like a file. Deeply personal questions like how much sex she's had and like what kind of sex and stuff like that. I'm like, that seems like the question like your doctor would ask you to make sure like, oh, okay, like we need to test you for this or whatever. There's zero reason why a fucking counselor needs to know who you gave head yesterday. Yeah. Like it's not, yeah. it's not a necessary fucking question. And it becomes clear later on in the movie because over the course of the movie, that counselor has been slowly acquiring more and more like bandages all over her face. Yeah. For like surgery scars. And you find out by the end of the movie that she is the wife of the sheriff who's been getting a lot of the body parts from the missing girls. Yep. And that interrogation at the beginning of the movie had nothing to do with the school, had nothing to do with any evaluation of the main character, had everything to do with evaluating her as a candidate to be kidnapped. Yep. Because if she had like an STD or something like that, then they don't want her because that might carry over through the surgery. Right. But the question that really gives it away that something weird's going on is when they ask her whether or not 
anyone would care if she disappeared. It was like, yeah, you're like, they don't, what? they don't quite word it that way. It's like worded like, uh, how popular, how popular are you? Are you? Rated from <laughs> everyone likes me to no one would care if I disappear. Exactly. And when that first happens, you're like, oh man, that's kind of fucked up. And you're not sure if it's like an exaggerated metaphor of how shitty schools are. And it kind of is, but it actually turns out to actually be a plot point later on when you're like, oh no, she was scouting out the fucking potential victims. Yeah. In the middle of all this, while they're trying to uncover everything that's fucking going on. Mm -hmm. By the way, if we didn't make this clear, like magic is real in this world. Oh yeah, because there's a point where it's very clear that even the stuff that the principal is doing is not 100% scientifically viable. No, he's all also like a creature and he can yeah. like, cast spells. Like he he, he forms buttholes but on the, the women's, women's chests. chests. Yeah. To like drain shit out of them. It's, yeah. It reminded me of existence. Yeah, yeah, he surgically places these atises on their chest yeah. so that he can suck things out of their anus into the anus he has on his chest. <laughs> yes. This is where the Cronenberg comes this, in, by this, the way. This is, yeah, once this stuff starts happening, the Cronenberg goes full tilt boogie. Like, I, Yeah, <laughs> like, and you're just sitting, I was just sitting there like, what the fuck is, is going, going on? on? It turns out her empathy is a two-way street. Yeah. She figures out by the end of the movie, she can do that to him and yeah. he does. Puts a vagina on the fucking misogynistic fucking uh, kidnapper dude. Yeah. On his chest, which is just a glorious fucking scene, watching him writhe in pain, having experienced just a minute fucking taste of womanhood. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the principle is very much like a condemnation of like Christian masculinity. Oh yeah, he is very much a representation, a stand-in for every single insecure, powerful man who has basically dedicated their entire life to maintaining the status quo. And in order to maintain that status quo, that means keeping women down yeah. and keeping men up. But also part of the status quo is keeping one's wives happy, right? Like, yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. There's that like nuclear family element, that American nuclear family element. Yeah, and there's also this weird screwed up element where he has trouble dealing with Pussy. He does. Like it's, literal vagina he has problems with. This part of the movie actually reminded me a lot of the movie Teeth. Yeah. Where one of the antagonists of the movie Teeth is the main character's brother, who has a, such an aversion to vaginas that he can only have anal sex with his girlfriends. Yeah. And it reminded me of that. Yeah. Yeah, and you find yourself going like, how have we subverted <laughs> instinct so much <laughs> that we've done this? And I'm not talking about like homosexual stuff here. It's still heterosexual. Oh yeah, he's still attracted to women. It's obvious a part of him resents that though. Yeah. But he also needs to control women and he also needs to conform women to the way he wants them to be. Yeah. And if you actually like pay attention earlier in the movie, there's a lot of like school shooter drills in the movie that he's yes. conducting. Yes. And if you notice all the advice and all the things that he's making the women do is actually making them easier victims and not actual survivor skills. Yeah, correct. He's like trying to anti final girl them. Yeah, yeah. He's trying to make it so that they don't like know how to fight back. Yeah, which makes sense logically as being the person who's been kidnapping the girls. He doesn't want them to be able to fight back against him. Right. But it also metaphorically makes sense for like the way the system raises women, right? Yeah. This movie's got layers. But here's the thing, when you get to the end of it, it's like very clear what the movie's saying. Yeah, yeah, it, it's very obvious. You're gonna be confused for 75% of the movie, but once you get to that last 25%, it all comes together. <laughs> and with that said, any final thoughts on your end? Don't bring your insecure masculinity to the movie. I'm yeah. just gonna tell you, if you want to challenge yourself and you're a dude, sure, please watch it. Sure. But know that if you need to see a movie that tells you something good about being a dude, other than, well, you didn't mean to. This is not the this movie. This is not the movie this is, that's going to do it one. for you. It's not, this movie doesn't provide that. Much like they clone Tyrone, this movie does a really good job of putting you in the headspace of another person. 
Oh yeah. And if you oh, yeah. are not a woman, if you're not feminine in any way, shape or form, then this movie will put you in the headspace of what it's like to be a woman in our society. A very surreal and exaggerated sense of that, but it will go into that headspace. Yeah, and, and that will include, God damn it, I can't trust dudes. Yeah, yeah. Even, even the dudes that are good and aren't actually a problem, they're not helpful. Yeah, that's the sting, right? Yeah. If you're a dude watching it, that's the sting. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Woo! Got me right there, director. <laughs> Holy shit. And with that said, my fellow gorehounds, where can they find you? Here on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Streaming late into the night. Uh, just come by the old channel, hit the notification bell, so when you come to YouTube, you will be notified. Whenever I'm online, which tends to be between like 7 and uh, 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you want to follow me on Twitter X, X Twitter. I mean, it is literally X Twitter. It is literally X Twitter. Mm -hmm. If you want to follow me on X Twitter, at Counting Jack is where I am on X Twitter. You can also find me on TikTok at Real Count Jackula. Yeah, fuck it. What about you? <laughs> Y'all know me. I'm the Horror Guru. You can find me at the Horror Guru on Twitter, on Twitch, on Instagram, Facebook, Blue Sky. Just look up the Horror Guru or Blood Splatter Cinema and I'll be there. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And don't forget to ring that notification bell so you're notified of my videos immediately upon their upload. And if you would like to help out either of us more directly, be sure to check out our Patreon pages. And remember, even a dollar a month can go a long way, but we will certainly accept more. <laughs> and with that said, my fellow Gorehounds, if you made it this far into the video, then I want you to comment below and be sure to comment below using the hashtag chest vagina. <laughs> Use the hashtag chest vagina because if someone hasn't seen this movie and didn't watch the spoiler section, they're gonna read that and go, what the fuck is this movie? And with that said, my fellow gorehounds, peace out and we'll catch y'all later. <laughs>